and we have some boots on the ground in Melbourne, none other than Mark Petchy, player, coach, our colleague, could be calling matches for the world feed. Petch, how you doing? I'm good. It's great to be with you guys. Yeah, it's a beautiful morning here down in Melbourne. Everything's good. It's great to see you. We wanted to get your thoughts. Obviously, the biggest story that's been taking up all the headlines the past couple weeks, Novak Djokovic, his ordeal, and then eventually getting deported from Australia. Uh, what's the feeling been like on site? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it sucked all the oxygen out of the pre-sort of events coming in here, so it's obviously been huge news. I think there's a lot of sympathy on both sides. You know, there's no question that he came down here ultimately with an exemption. So he came with his best intentions and felt as though he had sort of proved it that he could get in. Obviously, things dramatically changed and shifted. And then, um, and obviously, he didn't get in. And the vaccination issue is going to be huge, isn't it? Let's be honest, John. Honestly, um, you've already seen France say absolutely no chance that he's going to be able to go to Paris now. Uh, we just saw Sergio Palmieri in the last hour saying if he doesn't want to get vaccinated, he's not going to be able to play in Rome. He's got a couple of weeks where he says he's not going to speak. Uh, he's got a big decision to make. Is he to, to play at the moment? He's going to have to get, to get vaccinated. It's as simple as that. And there were a lot of players here that were uh, undeniably unhappy the fact that he had somehow found this medical exemption as well, because a lot of the, a lot of the players also don't want to get vaccinated as well. So, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about there. And I think from Mo Novak's point of view, I would say, John, that he needs to kind of make a stance here. On one hand, you've got his fans and everybody saying that, you know, he's a pro-choice guy, which you totally understand. But then his action is not to take the vaccine. And uh, obviously, from that point of view, that's a great paradox. And for a role model, people are going to look at his action rather than the fact that he's been offering the vaccines at his tournaments. So just let's just keep playing this out. Uh, we, we have seen number of tournaments, as you say, Mark, come out saying, look, you, you got to be vaccinated to come play here. Are you saying you think Novak is, is going to essentially capitulate and get this vaccine? I mean, how do you see this playing out, given what we know about Novak? It's, I mean, that is a great question, and I think that is the that is the multi-million multi dollar question, not just a million dollar question for, for Novak. This is obviously something that goes right to the core of his beliefs. I mean, if you've ever read any of the books that he's done, Bruce Lipton, uh, The Biology of Belief, it, it's, I've read it because I wanted to try and understand a little bit about where Novak comes from. It's pretty deep. It's all about cells in your body. We know also about how spiritual he is. I mean, this, this is something that is not going to be an easy decision for him to make a 180 on if he decides that he wants to try and continue playing his tennis career currently in this pandemic. This doesn't look like it's going to change for a while, the vaccine. I mean, France, Let's be honest, France is saying if you're not, haven't been double vaccinated in the last seven months, take away just being double vaccinated, you're, put, you're not allowed to go there. So it, it is huge for him in terms of his own principles. Let's, uh, let's, let's get back to Melbourne, but let's stick with another 34-year-old multiple major champion, Andy Murray, uh, in action. Obviously, a, a sentimental favorite. What will make this a successful tournament for Andy? I mean, how, how do you see sort of the, the range of options and outcomes for him faring in Melbourne? Well, I can tell you what, it, you know, for Andy, it's quarterfinals, semifinals, making a deep run is success. But I think for all of us mere mortals that are looking at his opening match against Basilashvili, it's getting through that. I mean, here's a guy that's got through to play, you know, the, the Sydney final, uh, the physical toll of some of those matches. Andy, still, since he's come back from the 2018, since the first hip surgery, the arthroscopic one that he had here, and then obviously the resurfacing, he's still averaging over two hours a match, which, you know, again, was pretty much the same pattern in Sydney, he is going to be fatigued. And you play a guy like Basil Ashvili, who plays a bit like Karatsa, who's hitting 60 winners and 60 unforced, you're chasing, you're moving dynamically, and he had to beat him in Sydney, and he's got to go against him in five sets. I think physically this is going to be a very tough match for Andy. The new racket's looking great, the bigger head that he's changed to. I think things are coming together, but physically this is going to be a huge ask for him. Andy, of course, former world number one. The current British number one pet is a guy named Cam Norrie, and he's already out of the event, taken out straight sets by the American Sebi Corda. What did you make of that result? Uh, I thought it was going to be tough for Cam. Obviously, he was one of those guys that potentially was going to move if the whole decision around Novak had been taken an hour before. Rublev would have been slotted in at the top of the draw, and Cam would have moved to Rublev's spot. And when I saw him playing Seb Corda, we knew he'd lost to him before. I was like, well, if Seb's recover from COVID, this is a very tough opening match for, for Cam. He's not going to hit too many winners on the, in these conditions. 
and Seb obviously, you know, is one of the up and coming American players. I I was surprised by the, the, the scoreline. I think the ATP Cup actually for Cam ultimately ended up being a disaster for him. He had three great, very tough matches, but he lost them all. Confidence was a bit low after coming off such an amazing 2021. So in hindsight, everything's perfect, right? You can make better decisions. It'll be interesting to see what Cam does next year in terms of which tournaments he's going to play prior to the AO. Let's go from the top British male to the top British female. Emma Raducanu starts her campaign off against Sloane Stephens. She's only won two matches since taking that U.S. Open title. What is a reasonable expectation for Emma this week and this year? Uh, this year, I think if she can stay inside the top 25, I think that would be a fantastic year for Emma, uh, given everything that's happened uh, in New York. She's still learning a lot about her game. She's still trying to put pieces of the puzzle together, to be honest. Um, she's still kind of figuring out everything. This is her first trip down under. Um, she's playing Sloan. I, I, I've said publicly, and I'll say it again now, I, I, I would be surprised that within two years if she's really challenging for another major. I know she's very determined. I know she's super ambitious and she'll probably get there. I'm a big buyer of her stock, but I do think the women's game at the moment, you look at someone like Maddie Keyes playing awesome tennis again, who, who could make a deep run here. Sloan's obviously going to have a lot of motivation to take on Emma. Um, and Emma's just feeling her way. So I, uh, that's for me personally. I think getting past Sloan today will be, will be a really impressive performance from Emma. Real quick, pick a winner, men and women. Uh, Medvedev on the men's side, and I am going to go with a complete outsider, and I'm going to go with Maddie Keys on the women's Ooh, New Americans. Wow. You love, you love it. Fantastic. Wow. I mean, she yeah. took out a champion in her first match, yeah. former yeah. champion, so Maddie Keys. I was the top 90. Yeah. It was good. It was good. Yeah. All right, uh, enjoy your time down there in Melbourne. We'll see you here in Santa Monica in February. Look forward to that. All the best, Patch. 